Uh, ladies and gen gen gentlemen, um, first of all, I must apologize that, that Xavier uh, has sadly been unable to attend to, to today for personal reasons. So uh, I'm just standing in for him. Uh, and for those who don't know me, I'm, my, my name's Alexander Justin, and I'm the CEO here of the exchange. Uh, but everyone calls me, J calls me J JJ. But really, on behalf of the group, I really want to offer you all an incredibly warm welcome here today. And thank you enormously for participating in this enormous event. We're absolutely delighted to be hosting it uh, here at the exchange and to be working with Immense Titi uh, totally on such an important event. Given the group's role in Italy, uh, I really should say buongiorno, given half the audience here, um, I apologize for my Italian accent. Uh, given our role in the group in Italy, the UK, and the rest of Europe, this topic is absolutely central to our markets and to, and, and, and to, to our own being, and obviously is very critical to many people here. And, and again, thank, thank you for showing such, such an interest. Supporting, in our mind, high quality governance, substance over form, uh, genuine appropriate flexibility, engendering trust and transparency between issues and investors, these are really key and desirable aims. And, and an event like today is a really important occasion, I feel, uh, as an opportunity to discuss those issues in what is always an evolving uh, uh, dy 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 dynamic. No nothing is ever static within this and the sharing the ideas uh, that everyone has around dealing with exactly those, those issues. So simply, again, a very warm welcome on behalf of the group. Thank you again for participating. Thank you for all the speakers uh, uh, for, for participating in well. And I'm, may I wish you all a very successful com conference here this afternoon. So thank you. Simon. Thank you very much, JJ. Um, I'm Simon Nixon, uh, Chief European Commentator at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, great. Welcome to this uh, seminar. Um, and thank you very much uh, to uh, Asanim for inviting me uh, to, to, to moderate this event. Uh, it's clearly a very timely and important um, discussion. Uh, at this stage of the European Eurozone crisis, clearly uh, corporate restructuring and uh, corporate finance are going to be play an incredibly important part in the nature of the Eurozone's recovery from here, the extent to which the European corporate sector can recapitalize itself and uh, and make itself competitive is clearly the, the biggest challenge. And so it seems to be a very important topic to be discussing uh, what role corporate governance could play in that. Uh, so um, to make some introductory remarks uh, before, uh, before we have the panel, uh, Sir David Walker, chairman of Barclays, and uh, Gabriele Galateri, the uh, chairman of the Italian corporate governance uh, committee and the chairman of, uh, of Generali will make some introductory remarks. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Sir David Walker to start. Thank you, Thank you Simon. It's, it's a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here to address this audience. Uh, at the outset, I do want to note in particular the research project promoted by Emittente Titoli, which in my view provides an excellent perspective for our uh, discussions. I do want to begin picking up on something Simon said with a comment on our European competitiveness. While acknowledging the um, imperfection of the data, the fallibility of judgments that are applied, I do want to mention that in the last World Economic Forum survey of global competitiveness, our European Union rank is 25 in 150 country sample, with Germany at four, the UK at 10, France at 23, and Italy at 49. I note also the familiar statistic that members of the European Union have just over 7% of the world's population, generate about a quarter of global output, but account for more than half, rather well over half, of global welfare spending. Uh, more economic statistics can readily be adduced to illustrate that our continent of Europe as a whole is punching well below its weight in the world economy. And as a result, relative and potentially absolute standards of living and social provision may just be unsustainable, even at present levels, without significant enhancement in overall economic performance. How European companies are governed and run 
will be a critical necessary, not a sufficient condition, obviously, but a critical necessary condition for improvement. Our focus today is on listed companies, but I do just want to observe that despite their limited access to public markets, both private equity and family-owned businesses, both important in <coughs> our two countries of the United Kingdom and Italy and elsewhere in Europe, enjoy some considerable comparative advantages as against the listed company form. They, they include in particular the narrowness of the agency gap between owner, the provider of this capital, and the agent, the board, and the executive of the company. Much less, uh, I think this is of particular importance, much less distracted by the preoccupation with quarterly performance, which figures so largely in the operation of listed companies. A good governance of listed companies won't, of course, itself assure all the improvement in performance that our continent needs. But I doubt if anyone here today would question that the return from still more effective governance and direction could be large indeed, both generally and especially so in some particular cases, and probably all of us have some particular cases in mind. In this context, I salute our friends in the Italian Corporate Governance Committee for the work that it's undertaken under the leadership of my old friend Gabriele Galatea di Giudinola, who will be speaking in a moment, drawing on this work on parallel experience in the UK and elsewhere in Europe, in particular France and Germany, and on this very interesting research promoted by Emittente Titoli, I want to identify five major themes which, despite evident differences in practice among European countries, should I suggest be common to all endeavour in this area. The first, critical to successful governance, is a board composed with the right balance of skills, knowledge and experience. There should be, in my view, no mandate or prescription in this respect. There's sometimes risk, it seems to me, that the quest for and definition of independence, which was really led by initiative in this country 20 years or so ago, can get in the way of achieving appropriate balance, which should always be a matter of judgment within the boardroom. In this respect, I attach great importance to the capacity and readiness of board members uh, to challenge a board which is well composed in all other respects, but is, for behaviour or other reasons, unready to challenge the executive, is at risk of falling far short in discharging its obligation to shareholders. And I think, certainly in this country, but I'm sure elsewhere, there's experience of boards in the last decade or so that have been well constituted in terms of the equipment of individuals, the main problem being that the boards were not together capable of challenging uh, the executive. Second, as the global economic and financial environment evolves often very rapidly and with major specific implications for particular industries or business lines, boards must be able and ready to oversee, stimulate, and if necessary, drive through change in strategic direction. In some situations, not always, the smartest strategy may be to be the industry leader in anticipating such, strange, such change. But failure to respond to such change after the event will never be an adequate strategy. Third, the oversight of talent development to ensure adequate internal succession or to identify material gaps that require filling through lateral hires is a key oversight responsibility of the board, I'd suggest. I mention it with some emphasis because it's an area in which chief and senior executives are often resistant, partly because moving good people to improve their bandwidth and capacity to play larger roles or wider roles may involve awkward adjustment in the short term. Boards, in my submission, must be unrelenting in their oversight of processes for talent development and succession planning, which should not be left exclusively to the executive. Fourth, in relation to remuneration, I suggest two core requirements. The first 
is a governance process led by non-executive members of the board to determine both overall remuneration policies and the levels and structure of remuneration for the most senior executives. The second is for substantial disclosures in the director's remuneration report on these policies and the remuneration arrangements for senior individuals. In the UK, and in particular in the industry from which I come banking, these policies and outcomes attract, uh, as you all know, intense shareholder, political and media scrutiny. But while we may consider that such attention is inordinate and out of balance, I think it would be unrealistic to think that it's going to go away any time soon. There will accordingly, no doubt, be persistent continuing interest in yet further and more specific regulatory intrusion. My judgment in this situation is that the best response is for the Director's Remuneration Report to aim for a standard of transparency that goes beyond the minimum required by regulation or recommended as best practice in the relevant code. A high degree of transparency should enhance the ability of shareholders to hold boards to account, which it's their prerogative and right, not obligation to do, as against further regulatory intrusion into the setting of remuneration, which in my submission has already gone far enough, if not too far. Fifth and last, while corporate governance should plainly not become a one-size-fits-all, box-ticking compliance exercise, the counterpart to appropriate flexibility in that respect should be a requirement for the board to disclose how it's discharging its governance obligation. I suggest there should be provision for explanation, this is comply or explain, and that we should attach great importance to that flexibility where the board is not in some respect in compliance with recommended practice. But more substantively, an established procedure for regular evaluation of board performance. In my view, evaluation of that kind is likely to be best achieved with the assistance of an external facilitator. While the principal objective should be the provision of guidance to the board on how to improve its performance, there should also be confirmation to shareholders that such an evaluation has been undertaken and that any appropriate action corrective action is being taken in the light of its findings. Let me just reiterate these themes quickly. They relate to composition of the board and behavioural characteristics in the boardroom, the readiness and ability of the board to adapt strategy in a timely and, if necessary, radical way, discharge of the key board responsibility for oversight of management, development and succession, a committee of non-executives to determine overall remuneration policies and remuneration for senior executives with substantial transparency in the annual report, and the institution of a process for regular evaluation of board performance. Well, very large effort has been committed over the last few years in the UK, Italy, Germany, uh, and elsewhere at the European level, including in the Commission in Brussels, in these debates and on the development of codes on governance. But there's been much less attention to the exercise of stewardship by asset owners and their fund managers, whose responsibilities might, I suggest, be seen as the reciprocal of the board's accountabilities to them as shareholders. The nature and effectiveness of the relationship between owner and agent depends critically on clarity as to the owner's objectives and practical arrangements for communication and consultation between the two sides. There's a tendency for asset owners to delegate more of their holdings to third-party fund managers who are, in my view, all too often assessed on relative rather than absolute performance and whose incentive arrangements may exacerbate rather than reduce the tendency of boards and CEOs to give too much attention to the short term. I readily acknowledge that relationships between shareholders and boards are fraught um, inevitably with complexity. They involve sensitive issues around market regulation, remuneration policies, shareholder activism, 
the rapid emergence of substantial new long-only asset owners, such as sovereign wealth funds, and at the opposite end of that particular spectrum, the disengagement from effective ownership that's implicit in high-frequency trading. All this underscores the major area of stewardship as a priority for attention in future work programmes of groups and discussions such as this. In the UK, the Financial Reporting Council now has a code relating to the responsibilities and conduct of asset owners and fund managers, which sits alongside, but separately, from the Code on Corporate Governance relating to boards. I believe that to be a necessary and appropriate separation and commend it for consideration by our Italian colleagues and elsewhere. My last point is a plea for greater, still greater collaboration in the whole area uh, that we're discussing this afternoon because it seems to me the greater the extent to which codes of the kind that have now been produced in the UK under the Financial Reporting Council and in Italy under uh, Gabriel Galateri's committee uh, can be put together in an articulate, well-judged way in our continent of Europe, the more effectively we're likely to be in holding back the intrusiveness of regulation. It's not that it's all inappropriate, but it virtually always has unintended consequences, which in my observation and experience for at least half the time are perverse. But with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to our discussion later in the afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, David. So uh, I'll turn straight now to, um, to Gabriele Galateri um, to follow. Well, thank you very much, David, for your kind words, first of all, and also for the last suggestions. I really appreciate very much uh, the invitation to work together, and uh, this is one of the reasons why actually we are here, in order to try to bring us uh, to the same point of uh, knowledge of uh, where uh, you are in the UK and where we are in Italy. So after thanking you, I would like to thank uh, the London Stock Exchange and uh, Sonim and the Mittenti Titoli for uh, giving me an opportunity let me see how, if you, oh, okay, someone is already turning the slides, to describe the status of the art of the Italian uh, corporate governance. I've been sitting, as many of you know, in uh, different boards around the world for many years, and I'm not hesitant to say that the Italian board practices experienced a quantum leap uh, over the past decade. I will start my presentation by outlining uh, the legal framework applicable to the Italian listed companies, the evolution of the Italian corporate governance code, and the characteristics uh, of the Italian Corporate Governance Committee, which is actually in charge of identifying the best practices, updating the code, and monitoring its implementation by listed companies. Then I would like to show the outcome of a survey conducted for the first time by the Italian Governance Committee under you know, the suggestion or trends of the FRC on the degree of compliance by Italian listed companies on the Italian code. As a third point, I will illustrate some aspects of the Italian approach to the comply or explain principle, and also in light of the recent European paper on this topic. You know that there is a recommendation of the Commission that moves in that sense. Finally, we will go over the issues that are likely to be addressed by the Corporate Governance Committee in the near future, and I will do this uh, hopefully in a rather quick way. Starting from the first topic, I would like to underline that the Italian legal framework has been strengthened over the past years in order to ensure a high degree of protection uh, of the investors. Mandatory rules applicable to listed companies are totally aligned with the European regulation, and in several cases, this has to be remembered, more stringent than the ones enforced in other European states. Italian laws, in fact, cover a number of issues that in other jurisdictions are dealt with uh, only by best practices. The Italian code, on the other side, has been frequently updated in order to align it to the international best practice, and on the basis of the outcome of the survey previously mentioned, the Italian listed companies are compliant with most of its recommendations. So we have also to clarify some uh, misunderstanding that sometimes uh, still exists. A particular attention has been paid to disclosure. In this perspective, we can rely on a significant amount of qualitative information, and you will notice that it is much more than normally you find in other 
practices on the structure and functioning of the board of directors, board committees, board of statutory auditors, on the attendance uh, by single board members uh, to board and committee meetings, on the length of the meetings uh, and the overall time commitment of board members, on the promptness and completeness of pre-meeting information. Again, full and detailed disclosure of directors and statutory auditors' compensation, we already, ha we already have it in Italy, on individual basis is provided by the Italian listed companies. General meetings on top of this are, as we say in Italian, glass houses. Access has become easy, full disclosure is provided to the market, also on the company's websites, where you can even find the general meetings detailed minutes. Shareholdings in listed companies have to be notified over the 2% threshold, while normally in other countries is 3%. Last but not least, strict provisions on related party transactions have been introduced. Directors and statutory auditors are elected with a slate voting system so that minorities can be, in any case, represented in the relevant boards. I will now briefly illustrate the most recent updates of the Italian Code, which was introduced firstly in 1999. In 2011, the last revision, the Code was significantly amended under three guiding principles, simplification, necessary amendments, and voluntary amendments. Simplification, on the one hand, the Code was streamlined by deleting or recasting some parts of the document so that we now have only a decalogue, 10 uh, principles. On the other hand, its application has been tailored to facilitate the compliance uh, with the code by small and medium-sized listed companies. You know that in Italy we have a number of them, so that in companies not belonging to the FTSE MIB index, which is the index of the major corporations in the stock exchange, it may be sufficient to appoint two independent directors instead of the rule of one-third of the board. And again, in smaller-sized companies, the establishment of one or more board committees may be avoided and the relevant duties may be discharged or assigned to the board of directors. As for the necessary amendments, the code obviously was simplified. As several recommendations during the period were transferred into laws over the years, such as the shareholder rights, the remuneration rules, the related party transactions, and so on. And then we have the voluntary amendments, which were rather important in order to increase the effectiveness of the recommendations in light of the most recent national and international best practices, notably the central position of the activities to be carried out by the board of directors, in line with what uh, Sir David just said, the committees, as well as their independent components were strengthened together with the internal control system that was rationalized. I now move on to illustrate the structure of the committee that has been set up to update and monitor the best practice in Italian listed companies, because I think that it has a particular characteristics that uh, you will appreciate, uh, hopefully, in terms of its uh, comprehension of uh, you know, the different uh, parts that, that, uh, that make the Italian market. Such committee was organized, in fact, for the first Italian code in 1999 by the Italian Stock Exchange and the Business Associations of Corporations, Assonime, Asset Managers, Associazioni, so we have also the investors in the committee, manufacturers, Confindustria, insurance firms, ANIA, and banks, Abis, who have the full spectrum of uh, operators of the market. In 2011, such historical supporters decided to form a new committee in order to ensure a continuous and structured process for the production and monitoring of the Italian companies' standards of contact that had to put in, put in place. The committee decided to regulate its function through a number of rules that have been drawn up with the aim of guaranteeing the continuity and regularity of its activities. So we have a a committee that lasts over time in order to constantly update uh, what is necessary. More precisely, we are 24 members designated by the supporters that I indicated before. Each member holds the office for three years and may be renewed. The committee meets at least once a year to examine the activity report drawn up by the chair and to approve the plan for the future activities. And of course, we can avail ourselves of experts who may give advice on the revision of the code. A crucial duty assigned to the committee that we will uh, review in a minute is to monitor the implementation of the code. I think that apart from making the rules and monitoring that the rules are applied is a, a, a substantial engagement. According to its mission, the committee decided to publish, starting from 2013, a yearly report on the implementation of the corporate governance code by listed companies with reference to the previous year, following the UK Financial Reporting Council example, I remember a meeting with uh, Baroness Hogg that suggested you know, that this had really to be done immediately. 
This report shows in an aggregate form the areas of corporate governance in which companies need to improve as well as those in which they are performing well. So in December 2013, the committee published such first report. Now we can examine some results emerging from the survey conducted in 2013, as I said, and the opinion of the committee on certain governance issues. I would like to provide some preliminary methodological notes. The report is divided into two sections. The first one offers an overview on the most significant uh, governance issues in relation to the corporate governance code recommendations, while the second analysis is on a specific topic. In 2013, the analysis focused on the procedures adopted for the <coughs> board evaluation. For its analysis, the committee decided to rely upon a multiple inconsistent outside sources, research centers, academic ones, uh, corporate governance experts, and mainly a Sony emittenti titoli and concept data, so as not to depend on any specific source of information. As a general comment, uh, we can find that almost all listed companies declared their intention to comply with the corporate governance code. A limited number of issuers, stable over the years, explicitly announced their decision not to comply with, or not to continue to do so, the whole corporate governance code but disclosed some information on their corporate governance system. In nine cases, companies provided the reasons for their non-compliance, generally referring to company size and structure, and in some cases to the appropriateness of their own governance model to the specific features of the company. Now, the committee believes that the decision not to comply in all or in part with the code that does not involve a priori and negative evaluation being aware of the fact that this is may be contingent on several factors. For instance, the company may not have reached the structure that allows the full implementation of all the recommendations, for example, in the case of a recently listed company, or it may evaluate that some recommendations are less useful for or incompatible with the corporate governance model or with the legal and financial features of the company. So the committee believes that in such cases it is advisable not to comply with the recommendations of the code of course, providing detailed explanations for doing so, rather than achieve a more formal adherence, a mere formal adherence to it. Among the issues adhering to the corporate governance code, the committee has generally observed a good level of quantitative and qualitative information provided in their corporate governance reports. While appreciating the degree of transparency, the committee encourages the issuers to make an extra effort to be exhaustive and complete in order to enable a more explicit and reliable representation of their governance. In particular, the committee encourages issuers to pay particular attention during the drawing up of the report, to avoid generic and formalistic expressions in case of non-compliance, to disclose detailed and exhaustive explanations for the non-compliance, and it recommends also the issuers to disclose any governance solution adopted as an alternative to the compliance uh, with the code and indicate, in case of non-compliance, if the situation is intended to be only temporary and when the company expects to comply with the recommendation. And I can tell you, as a practitioner, not uh, just as a, an expert of governance, that being in the board of different companies, uh, this is really taken very seriously. So it is considered not just uh, a self-disciplined suggestion, but it is uh, it has you know the weight from a psychological point of view for the companies, also of a law. Now uh, let's uh, result. Uh, let's uh, let's look at what the results are of this monitoring on the composition of the boards. And moving to the figures relating to the composition of the board, we note that the practice is fully aligned with the standards set by the code. The code recommends that the board is made up of executive and non-executive directors and that an adequate number of non-executive directors uh, shall be independent. Over the years, companies gradually aligned the composition of their board of directors to the corporate governance code recommendations. In general, boards have a balanced composition and are composed by directors belonging to the categories suggested by the code. On average, the board of directors is made up of 10 directors while in the past we had uh, 15, 19, 20 people, of which 2.7 executive, here we are magicians because we have people that split in part, <laughs> 2.7 executives, 3.2 non-executive, non-independent, and four non-executive independent. The size of the board varies, of course, according to the company size and sector. Now, the topic of the independent directors, as Sir David has underlined, is one of the key points of corporate governance. The 2011 code, in order to strengthen the best governance practices, recommends 
that in companies belonging to the FTSE MIB index, I recall uh, the main index of the stock exchange, at least one third of the board shall be made up of independent, while in, other com in the other companies there shall be at least uh, two independent directors. The Corporate Governance Code recommends also the appointment of a lead independent director in some circumstances, such as when uh, the chair of the board uh, is the CEO of the company, or in the event that the chair is also the person controlling the issuer. Furthermore, among companies listed on the FTSE MIV index, the lead independent is appointed also upon the request of the majority of the independent directors. In general, 100 companies appointed are lead independent directors. What is interesting also is to note how 30 companies that are not in the situations identified by the code established anyway the figure of the lead independent director on a voluntary basis. So the committee appreciates very much the implementation of high corporate governance standards, also without an explicit recommendation. And this is a point that I notice also, if I, you allow me a parenthesis, I'm sitting in a board in the board of a couple of companies not listed, and these companies are applying the same rules uh, that are requested for this government, which is a good sign that the culture is wide spreading you know, around uh, the country on, uh, beyond you know, the, the, the boundaries of the stock exchange. So in addition, in order to, to achieve greater transparency towards institutional investors, the committee underlines the importance of a, an a priori commitment of the majority shareholder to encourage the issuer to appoint a lead independent director whenever it is recommended, so to take a, a commitment beforehand. As for the function of the board, among the recommendations to ensure the proper and effective functioning, the code pays particular attention and this is something that, as a practitioner, again, I find fundamental to the flow of information before and during the meetings of the board of directors. In this regard, the code recommends, among other, uh, other things, that the documentation relating to the agenda of the board is made available to directors in a timely manner prior to the board meeting. The board of directors is also required to provide explicitly in the corporate governance report, some information on the promptness and completeness of the pre-meeting information, providing details on the prior notice uh, usually deemed adequate uh, for the supply of documents, and specifying whether such prior notice has been usually given. Almost all listed companies provided some information on the prior notice supply, and more than half of the companies that provided some such information disclosed precisely the timing that is normally considered adequate. The prior notice deemed adequate varies from 2.8 to 3.4 days in relation to different terms uh, in agenda. The committee invites the company to improve the prior notice period for board members to receive the documentation before the board, to provide more detailed documentation uh, on the degree of compliance uh, with the notice period, and to ensure the necessary disclosure and in-depth analysis during board meetings. When it is not possible to provide pre-meeting information with adequate prior notice, the committee recommends that issuers provide the detailed information during the meetings, as well as an adequate disclosure in the corporate governance reports. Obviously, a board cannot be effective if uh, it has not available the documentation. And being the documentation normally these days quite complicated and quite consistent, obviously you need time uh, to go through it. Now, the Corporate Governance Code also requires issuers to provide on their report uh, some information on how this, the self-assessment procedure has been developed, uh, the board evaluation uh, that uh, Sir David mentioned, and they consider also an extremely important element uh, of uh, good governance. So 77% of the listed companies uh, in our stock exchange disclose that they have carried out the self-evaluation of the board of directors. The committee noticed uh, that the self-assessment process on the function of the board and its committees is on the rise, in particular among larger companies and in the financial and insurance sector. In 20% of the cases, the board evaluation is carried out by a board committee, in some cases by independent directors, in 4% uh, of the cases is carried out by the chairman of the board. However, no chairman has such a role among the FTSE MIB companies. The appointment of an external advisor, sorry David, is more frequent but only 70% in the case of the financial sector and among the larger companies, especially the government-owned ones. 32 companies in total appointed an external advisor. The committee believes in summary that the Italian market is keeping up with other European countries, having regard to the use of such tool, the board evaluation, that allows to identify areas of excellence of the board of directors and their committees to be consolidated and the areas of concern to be improved. 
At the same time, the committee recommends that any decision not to carry out the board evaluation should be adequately explained. The committee does not provide specific indication concerning the corporate body to be entrusted with the self-assessment procedure, nor is of the opinion that the best solution in terms of successful implementation of the process is the appointment of an external advisor. But I will bring your comment uh, to the next committee, David. In any case, it is important that the board evaluation is carried out in a conscious and effective way. Finally, the committee invited listed companies to a stricter implementation of the recommendation, this is also extremely important to me, to provide shareholders before the renewal of the board and taking into account the outcome of the self-evaluation with indication as to the professional skills deemed appropriate for the composition of the board. Information on this point is only available in 48 reports, 27% of those companies that provide information on the board evaluation process. We saw in the previous charts how detailed is the information available regarding the Italian uh, company's governance. The performance of the survey has been possible thanks to the exhaustive reports disclosed by listed companies. But the question is why information is so precise and detailed? The answer to such a question can be found both in Italian laws and best practices. The, the, at the best practice level, according to the Corporate Governance Code, each Italian listed company adopting the code shall provide in its uh, Corporate Governance Report, in quote, accurate, concise, and easily understandable information on the manner in which each single recommendation contained in the principles and criteria has been effectively implemented. And if an issuer has not implemented one or more principles or criteria, it shall supply adequate information. So the disclosure required by the code that goes beyond the mere implementation of the comply or explain rule, as it is intended to provide to the market an accurate description of effective behaviors to the boards in relation to the governance model adopted by each company. Maybe I, uh, I was going too quick uh, compared to the slides. Uh. A similar approach has been adopted by the Italian law, which requires listed companies to prepare and publish an annual report on corporate governance and ownership structures. In this report, <coughs> each company shall disclose, among other things, under the, the, uh, compl the compliance with the law, information about the adoption, if any, of a code of conduct for corporate governance explaining any non-compliance with one or more recommendations of that code. So we have two obligations uh, to make this uh, uh, clear. The report shall disclose, among other things, specific information about the ownership structure, rules for the appointment and replacement of directors, main features of the internal control and risk management systems, regulation of the AGM, structure and functioning of the administrative and control bodies. I'm about to close my presentation. But before the end, let me indicate what the Italian uh, Corporate Governance Committee has planned to do in the near future. As you can see, information available about Italian companies' governance is vast and accurate. The questions are, is the quality of information equal to the quantity? Do corporate governance reports published by Italian listed companies allow the readers to understand the essence of their governance? To give answer to these questions, the committee decided to include in the next survey on the implementation of the code to be carried out by the end of 2014 an in-depth analysis of the quality of the information and explanations issued by companies. In the meantime, we will, of course, continue monitoring the evolution of the regulation and national and international best practices in light of a possible revision of the Italian Corporate Governance Code in 2015. And we would be more than happy to move in that direction along with the same uh, views that the uh, FRC has here. But concluding, I would like to say that overall, we are reasonably satisfied with the results obtained so far. And from my personal experience in different markets, we certainly are today in Italy, I wouldn't say maybe best in class, but certainly on a very comparable basis with the other major financial markets. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabrielli. Um, I think are we going to have some take some a couple of questions from uh, b yeah. before uh, before uh, we move to the panel. I, does anybody want to um, put a question to Sir David Walker or to uh, Gabrielli Galateri? <laughs> I said yes. I said him too. <laughs> uh, yes, in the middle. Yes.
So maybe just speak up. <laughs> wondering, uh, and I would like your comment on this, whether, especially in this country, but maybe elsewhere as well, we are coming full, full circle, in a sense, in corporate governance. Uh, we started with a very brief statement of principles, uh, which expanded to a pretty complicated set of rules, against which, of course, we comply or explain. Um, in this process of expansion of rules, a whole industry was, was created on both sides uh, of the issuers on one hand and the, the investors on the other, including the intermediaries such as the FRC here or your committee in Italy. Um, and we now have a fairly well-equipped group of people to actually understand governance and assess governance on its own merits. So I was wondering whether we should go full circle and go back to a system which is not very, very detailed in, 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 in the way it approaches governance. It, it, it uh, enunciates a, a certain, certain principles. It provides a certain way of disclosing things, but leave to the actors in the market um, the the initiative, if you want, of explaining and of understanding the explanation. Should we just take very quickly? Okay. No, I mean, from my point of view, I, I fully share your, your point of view because we are, uh, you know, dying under uh, a number of uh, requests, regulations, norms, laws that becomes really unbearable. But uh, I think it can be done. I mean, when I said that in the revision, the last revision of the code in Italy, the first thing that they used was simplification. It was exactly that idea to go back from uh, a much uh, bigger number of principles uh, to fewer principles, particularly because we don't want to repeat what the, what the laws already say. We want to add uh, out of self-discipline things that we consider, and you, you saw the wide panel of actors of the market that contribute to this uh, discipline, that are really useful for a better function of the market. No more, no less, but particularly no more. Very well. Thank you. Very perceptive question, if I may, still upon. I'm very sympathetic to the approach you describe because I think it's an enlargement, and you saw in my fifth theme, I, I linked it to comply or explain. And I think the proposition that boards should be left greater elbow room, marge de manoeuvre, flexibility, to give an account of their performance by the standards that are set out in the code, but which are applicable to a particular company or situation, is very important. However, I think one has to be quite careful about this. Uh, while I'm sympathetic, I mean, attach great importance to self-evaluation of the board, I think there are quite a lot of tricky questions uh, that arise in the doing and the explanation of it. One question is, who are the people who help you? We, uh, Ga Gabriel Galateri and I talked about external facilitation. I mean, I have to say in this country, the quality of external facilitation is like most other things, variable. There's very good external facilitation, and on occasion I've seen it when it's not well done, and that's worse than useless. It can be positively misleading. A second question, given the, the quality of the board's self-appraisal process depends critically on the confidence that the individual board member has in the confidentiality of remarks that he or she make to the invigilator, evaluator, the uh, assessor. And the question is how that the results of all that are delivered and to whom. And then there's the question of the criteria to be applied to the transparency or disclosure. It's plainly important to be able to say that an evaluation has taken place. I think we need to be quite thoughtful about how we start giving guidance to chairmen and boards on how they describe what's been done and what follow-up action is being taken for two reasons. One is there are internal sensitivities within the boardroom 
this individual is not fit and probably needs to be um, transitioned out of the board over time. That's not something that can be talked about in any very easy or direct way. And secondly, of course, some of the issues may be commercially sensitive. So I think it's really important that we tread, we move in the direction that you described, Stilpon. And I think in this country, most companies are headed in that direction if they're not already doing it. I think there is emerging a cadre of evaluators of high quality, but the, the quality is still quite uneven, and I'm in favor of some sort of standards to be set there. But I'd be very wary of, and I, it'll be interesting to know whether Stephen Hadville has something to say about this later, from the SRC, of setting standards, regulatory intrusion in this place, which start to create new specificity about how it should be done. Let's retain some elbow room and marge de manoeuvre. And I think the encouraging thing is that as at least the long only investor community develop a corporate governance capability, the people they have who are often the right, have to be the right side of the insider uh, wall can start to appreciate what's being said in these appraisals and exercise some judgment of a valuable kind around them. Thank you very much, Sir David. Now, sorry, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, and I think we're going to have to um, to move on to the panel. So, uh, thank you very much indeed, Sir David. Thank you. Thank Okay, so um, now we uh, move on to the panel. I, I should have, of course, uh, beginning. So David mentioned it, but of course, uh, given a, a, a shout out for uh, for the book, um, boards and shareholders in European listed companies: facts and context and post-crisis reforms. Um, so uh, by uh, by Massimo Balcredi and uh, Guido Ferrarini. That's the the, uh, the 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 research that we're discussing. So um, I, to, to to open our discussion, I. Uh, Go straight to Guido Ferrarini to, to discuss some of the, the findings from the report. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, my task is quite complex. In about 10 minutes, I should speak about our volume, introduce uh, the reform proposals in Brussels, and make some critical comments, which is, of course, almost impossible. So one way of doing it was, I thought, was to find the title for my talk. Often looking for titles gives an, a very short idea of what the, the speaker wants to say. <coughs> and yesterday, drafting a few notes, I thought that the right title for what I'd like to say is, um, should the EU rebalance the powers of boards and shareholders at listed companies? And well, I drafted this uh, title where, where, while I was in Milan yesterday. And coming to London today, I thought that the title should be quite different. It should be, uh, should the UK approach to boards and shareholders' powers at listed companies become the rule for Europe? And in fact, if you look at the recent proposals, you find that these proposals from Brussels uh, follow very much the UK approach to corporate governance. If we look at these proposals from a continental European perspective, uh, they bring about a major of the relationship between boards and shareholders. So if they get adopted, there will be a big shift of power from boards to shareholders, that is to say, to institutional investors. This is not something very new from a UK perspective, but it's a major reform uh, from 
a continental perspective, particularly if we consider that we are talking here about European regulation. So we are not saying that the UK model is simply exported to the rest of Europe. We are saying that the UK model becomes mandatory for the rest of Europe. And this broad shift of powers from boards to shareholders is, let's say, imposed to all countries in Europe with a kind of one-size-fits-all one approach. Now, if we look at our volume from this perspective, um, I guess uh, our volume provides a lot of criticism uh, for this type of approach of the Commission. Uh, we collected in the volume a lot of uh, statistical data about corporate governance in Europe. And of course, we found many, many different things. But on the whole, we did not find uh, very large market failures as to corporate governance as it is in Europe in non-financial companies. Of course, I'm not talking about financial institutions. I'm mainly talking about non-financial companies. So what our empirical research says is that, after all, the situation is not so bad. Actually, the situation has been steadily improving over the years. So if we take remuneration, for instance, the transparency as to remuneration has been steadily increasing in all our countries, not only in the UK, where there is mandatory legislation to this effect, but also in countries like France, Germany, and Italy, and so forth. Uh, what the Commission would like to do is to make it mandatory, uh, in the case of remuneration, for instance, uh, to have a binding vote on remuneration policy. So there would be a big shift here, not only a recommendation, mandatory legislation, not only an advisory vote, rather a binding vote on boards. And this is a big change, as I said, not so much from the UK perspective, but from the perspective of the other countries. And the implication of our empirical research is that there are not enough grounds for this big shift in European regulation. We could have the individual member states adopting legislation to this effect. So we have countries which have, which have mandated, for instance, uh, remuneration committees, or countries which have legislated on uh, say on pay. Generally, however, legislation provides for advisory votes, votes. And yet there are countries which have adopted uh, a binding vote system. Uh, from our perspective, this is fine. I mean, each individual country makes the choice depending on the ownership structure, on the legal system of the given country. We are doubtful about the fact that this should be done at a European level. And not only for executive compensation, also in other areas. For instance, in the area of related parties transactions. Uh, again, in Italy, uh, we have elaborated quite uh, complex regulation concerning related party transactions which is mainly centered on the board. However, the, the European Commission would like uh, to adopt uh, the, the UK system in which, uh, at least for major related party transactions, there should be an approval by the shareholder meeting. Uh, this is no doubt fine for the UK, which is also a diffuse ownership country, but we really doubt that this system could work in concentrated ownership countries like Italy or Germany, where, of course, the shareholder meeting 
is dominated by controlling shareholders would be, however, excluded from the vote. So that uh, the voting would be left to, to minorities, which we don't know exactly what they will be. They will not be necessarily institutional investors. Uh, in the end, what I see and what is to me the main problem in this uh, shift of powers is that we risk uh, uh, deconstructing boards. That is to say, we risk to nullify the, the, the huge work that has been done on works, on board, boards, excuse me. Uh, Sir David and Mr. Galateri, they explained very well uh, all the work which has been done by uh, uh, corporate governance committees as to boards and uh, my feeling is that this shift of power um, that uh, the Commission would like to implement presents a high risk of uh, really diminishing the focus on boards with the idea that shareholders can do better. Um, maybe I've taken all my time, so uh, my presentation of the European reform has been no doubt partial and critical, but uh, I guess I'll, I'll maybe come back to this uh, later. Um, thank you very much, Professor Ferrarini. Um, so uh, to, to, to respond to, to those comments, uh, Colin Mayer of Oxford um, University, I understand actually that all the speakers have their own microphone, so only I need to, 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 to hold this one. So but anyway, it's over to you, um, Professor okay, thank Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd just like to congratulate Guido and Massimo on the production of their book. If you haven't read it, can I strongly urge you to read it? Because it's certainly worth reading. Uh, and if you reckon you haven't got time to read it, then you can follow the principle of Woody Allen, who went on a speed reading course and then read War and Peace. And he concluded that it was about Russia. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a little bit more out of this book. I want to talk about one aspect of the Commission's proposals, uh, and that relates to the issue of related party transactions, because as Guido was suggesting, I think it's got far-reaching implications. The recommendation from the Commission is that shareholders should have votes on the most important transactions involving uh, related parties, and it's defined significant transactions as being in excess of 5%. Now, the Commission's view is that that's a, a modest obligation. And I'll quote from what they say. In view of the fact that the threshold would be relatively high, for instance, 5% of the assets only a limited number of transactions would be subject to this obligation. Well, we have quite a lot of experience in this country of related party transaction disclosures. And we have it in particular in the context of another rule that we've got in this country, and that reg reg relates to class one transactions. Class one transactions are transactions that are in excess of 25% of the company's assets. So while the Commission might regard its 5% requirement as being modest, it's actually extremely stringent in relation to our Class I action, uh, uh, transactions over here. Now, there's one area in which those rules are of particular significance, and that relates to acquisitions. It means that there is a distinction between acquisitions that are greater than 25% of the acquiring company's assets and less than 25%. Now, as you'll be aware, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that a lot of acquisitions fail, at least that they fail from the point of view of the acquiring company. Now, in some respects, that's rather puzzling because it poses the question, well, why do acquiring shareholders allow value-destructing 
acquisitions to take place. And the obvious answer to that is that they haven't got enough power or authority to prevent those transactions from taking place. Now, what a class one requirement does is to basically confer that power upon them because it gives them a right to vote on whether or not that transaction should go ahead. And it's therefore very interesting to pose the question, what is the difference between performance of acquisitions of greater than 25% and less than 25%, in other words, class one and class two transactions? Well, a, a, doctoral a former doctoral student of mine, in conjunction with a number of other authors, have a looked at exactly that issue, essentially pairing together class one and class two transactions. And the results are remarkably interesting and striking. The result is that in class two actions, which are not subject to shareholder approval, one gets the result that is frequently quoted of a significant proportion of value-destroying acquisitions from the point of view of the acquiring shareholders. That is to say, the share price of the acquiring company goes down. In class one transactions, on the other hand, where shareholders do vote, those negative share price reaction transactions are basically eliminated. It's as if the distribution <coughs> is truncated at zero and one's basically just observing uh, positive share price reactions on the part of class one acquiring companies. Now that's not because most of those acquisitions actually come to the vote. On the contrary, most of them don't. But the reason why it appears to be highly effective is that it's a self-discipline on the part of management of acquiring companies. Basically, acquiring companies don't try to undertake transactions that they know are likely to be thrown out by their own shareholders. Now what that suggests is that such rules about requiring votes can be extremely important in improving corporate governance and avoiding abuses that might otherwise take place in terms of shareholder rights. But it's also the case that the introduction of such rules across Europe will be extremely far-reaching in terms of its consequences. And I really want to pick up one of the themes that David Walker mentioned in his presentation, and that relates to the issue of how corporate governance is related to real economic performance. Because as I've just indicated, much of the analysis of what is done in terms of corporate governance <laughs> relates to one indicator, one measure of performance, share price returns, in this case of the acquiring company's shareholders. But that, of course, does not ensure that there are overall value-enhancing transactions. They may come at the expense of other parties. They may come at the expense of employees or communities, or indeed what benefits short-term shareholders may not be in the interest of long-term shareholders. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the long-term performance of acquisitions in terms of share price returns is worse than that of its short-term performance. Now, what this in particular points to is the importance of thinking about corporate governance beyond just protecting minority shareholder interests or just relating uh, management performance back to that of shareholders, in other words, overcoming agency problems, to thinking more broadly about how does corporate governance relate to economic performance, and in particular to those aspects of economic performance that are most relevant here, namely investment, innovation, and growth. And I want to just illustrate this in relation to some pronounced differences that uh, exist between the two countries that are best represented here today, the UK and Italy. In the UK, uh, just 20% of the largest listed companies are family-owned. 
Now, family ownership is of importance, not just in terms of the fact that family ownership may have features of uh, long-term investment that uh, are not uh, always observed in widely held companies, but also because there is increasing evidence to suggest that their financial performance, as measured by uh, returns on equity, are often better than equivalent uh, widely held listed companies. In the case of the UK, of the largest listed companies, just 20% of them are family owned. In Italy, of the largest listed companies, by which I mean the largest thousand, uh, uh, the, 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 the largest group of listed firms on the uh, Italian stock market, 50% of them are family owned. In the UK, 70% of listed companies are widely held. In Italy, under 50% of companies are widely held. In the UK, the average period for which a family persists as an owner of a corporation is about 20 years. It's, in most UK companies, families do not go on owning for more than the first generation. They don't even stagger on to the second generation. They're sometimes described as being established by fanatical founders and inherited by squabbling siblings. In Italy, the average family firm persists for at least 90 years. They go on from generation after generation. Now, associated with that is also the observation that while in the UK the price at which blocks of shares are valued on stock market is about the same as that of widely held shares. In, the, in Italy, there's a substantial premium associated with block holding. In other words, in Italy, there's evidence to suggest that the family owners are deriving substantial private benefits, whereas in the UK, those private benefits are largely not observed. And the difference for that, in large part, has historically related to, we hear that it's changing substantially in Italy, historically has related to much stronger minority investor protection than has existed uh, in most other parts of the world. As one illustration of that, the London Stock Exchange, the LSE, discourages the holding of dual class shares and companies that basically are in a position where they are exploiting those private benefits of control. Now that's potentially very desirable and beneficial in terms of promoting liquid dispersed markets. But it discourages the listing of companies that wish to retain control in the hands of their family owners. Now, in nearly all countries around the world, dual class shares or pyramid structures of control or a mixture of both are observed, except in the UK. And the UK is, in this respect, very different from probably the most liquid stock market in the world, namely the New York Stock Exchange, where dual class shares are frequently observed. Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, all came to the stock market with dual class shares. It's the reason why Jack Ma enlisting Alibaba is not going to either Hong Kong, which basically has UK style rules, or London, but is going to New York. It's the reason why Manchester United, Manchester United, went to the New York Stock Exchange. So what this is pointing to is that strong protection of minorities may be a very important element in terms of encouraging minority participation, but it may come at a price, at a price of promoting diversity of types of ownership systems and at possibly at the expense of promoting entrepreneurship and family uh, investments. Now, I think that the EU has been, or the, East, the European Commission, I say, should say, has been quite slow 
to grasp the notion that the agenda of corporate governance has moved beyond that of simply the protection of minority shareholders or resolving the agency problem in companies. And it's moved on to a, a much more significant issue of how can corporate governance promote economic performance, growth, investment, and innovation. And in this respect, I think the OECD is being much more at the forefront of trying to take that agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, so to, to follow up with that, we're going to turn to uh, Sergio Alberelli to uh, give a corporate, or more, a more corporate point of view from, uh, uh, for, uh, from uh, Sergio works for Fidelity. So I'll pass to you, um, microphone's there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to if it's possible, focus your attention on a few words that Dr. Galateri said before. I, how the quality of the governance in Italy has improved in the last few years. What you have seen in this presentation is a fantastic recap of all the various steps that led the country being probably on the forefront of good corporate governance. It's not a question of making a statement, it's a question of seeing things in the fact. And I give you two examples. Uh, in the last uh, 18 months, a significant discussions took place in the country regarding the governance of large companies, large listed companies, with significant headlines on uh, newspapers and discussions about what was going on in those companies, et cetera, et cetera. After months and months of discussion, what we have today, we have two of the largest companies of the Italian stock market going into a different approach to governance. And this different approach to governance has been highly qualified and approved by the market. Because participation of foreign asset manager to the annual general meetings, participation to the selection of these late minorities and so on and so on is incredibly increased. We have reached in one of those annual general meetings a high record, a 40% record of participation of foreign asset managers. So these are the facts and not the works that are testifying that the quality of the governance in the Italian market has increased. On the other hand side, let's never forget that governance is a combination of efforts between different stakeholders. Obviously, the regulators are on top, but when we say stakeholders, we have to incorporate the institutional investors, the listed companies, et cetera, et cetera. And from my personal experience in Italy, being part as a member of the Asso Gestione, the Italian Association of Asset Managers, and being the chairman of the Corporate Governance Committee, I can tell you that the cooperation between the various stakeholders has incredibly increased in the last few years. And I have to say, uh, again, we need to see facts. Huh? And I can show you something which for me is very important. These are two simple pages with my notes. Huh? It's about a meeting we had as Asso Gestione on February 26 huh, with Mr. Patuano. Mr. Patuano is the Chief Executive Officer of Telecom Italia. The date is not casual. It's the day before a Board of Directors meeting when Mr. Patuano was presenting his new idea about the corporate governance of the company. And coming to a suggestion in a two hours meeting, presenting what was supposed to be the plan of changing the corporate governance, it is something that in the Italian market is probably the first time ever which happened. So it's a clear indication that the cooperation between on the one hand side listed company on the other hand side institutional investor can lead to significant improvements in the corporate governance of very important listed companies. And this company now, regardless of the fact that everything which is written here will be implemented or not, is now more favorably seen by investors, by international investors. Similar consequence in the generality situation where the participation of foreign asset manager to the latest annual German meeting has been incredibly high. If you think that these two pages are just a, a list of items about changing the corporate governance, you're totally wrong. This is an historical document, I like to say, which is proving how the governance is going on in Italy and how the governance can be utilized as an, as an instrument, as an item to show that the country is moving toward the right direction in making sure that the efficient capital market will be participating to the left of the country itself. 
No need to say uh, we as asset managers and again as a suggestion have done our own job. And I have to be very grateful to Professor Siniscalco right here, who used to be our president, our chairman, uh, a few years ago. He stepped down only a few months ago, actually. He led us into three very special areas. The first one was very important, stewardship code. Associazione produced a stewardship code which was presented to the Italian Stock Exchange Corporate Governance Committee. I think it's a very, very good document. It's basically accepting the principle of the FAMA. You can imagine how it can be complex for Italian asset management companies to apply all these um, rules which are embedded into the stewardship code. When you think about the Italian asset management industry, think about that most of the asset managers are small companies. And the small companies accepting to implement the stewardship code is basically making an investment on its quality. And to see that this code has been accepted by the Italian companies, then we'll be implementing it in 2015, is giving you a great idea on how the quality is looked after, not just by the issuer, but also by the asset managers. The second step, and again, thank you very much, Professor, was the separation of the activities performed by the Corporate Governance Committee. It has been split into two. The Corporate Governance Committee per se, in charge of the principle of the governance, and on the other hand side, the so-called Fund Managers Committee, which is a variable committee, where the decisions are taken about selecting the potential candidates for the slate to be presented in the annual general meetings. This is absolutely important because this way we avoid misidentification of who does what, and we concentrated that suggestion on the principle, which is the most important part of it. We provide support to the fund manager in order to select the candidates, but the decision is here. <coughs> the decision about the quality of the governance stay within the suggestion. And then I like to say which one of us when talking about governance has to also look inside the association, the association itself is changing the governance. We are introducing for the first time for the association minority list as well, in order to define the member of the management board of association. In essence, what we say to others, we like to see protection of minorities, protection to diversity and so on and so on, is what we apply internally in association as well. This is, I do believe, the best way to promote proper governance. Applying the same principle to the associazione allows us to be credible when we talk about governance externally. What we can, be, what we can do going forward, obviously what I've seen in these two pages is just amazing. This is great project of new corporate governance. I expect more foreign asset manager to understand that the corporate governance in Italy is going to be a key driver in a positive term for their decision about investing their portfolios. And I personally believe that more and more international asset managers will be investing in the Italian listed companies because of a good corporate governance and not only because there are significant opportunities about return on investments. The return on investment is important, but in essence, if you properly apply your stewardship code and you want really to engage with listed companies, you need to see good governance. And I can say this is a good governance. Thank you very much, um, Sergio. Um, so uh, finally, to complete the panel, uh, pass to Stephen Hadrill, the Chief Executive Officer of the Financial Reporting Council. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, is this, this is working. Oh, the microphone, okay, good, gentlemen. Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to congratulate Guido and team on the, what you've managed to achieve and also it's been a, I think a fantastic story today to hear the development of corporate governance in Italy is very encouraging. Um, Guido you said that uh, there was a question about whether the, the UK model should become the rule for Europe and normally when we suggest that in Brussels it's the kiss of death for whatever we want to suggest so um, I'm, I'm very happy for you to suggest it but I, it's probably not a good idea for us to do so. Um, I, I think that the link uh, that Colin ha and uh, David have drawn between corporate governance and, uh, and economic performance is very much at the heart of that, this, this debate. And everything we propose from a corporate governance perspective ha has, has got to take that into account. What is the real economic impact of it? I was very much involved in the UK government's 
reform of company law, which led to the longest act of parliament we have in the UK in 2006. I, um, that set out as a simplification project um, and we completely failed, frankly. And I think one of the reasons we failed was because uh, we started off very much thinking about it from a legal perspective rather than from an economic perspective. The, the goal was, you know, make this uh, a, a legal structure that was easily, easy to deal with um, rather than what is the, you know, what are the economic drivers that we, we, we need to respect and achieve. And I, I suppose I'll just offer that, that comment. I think that we've had a lot of uh, debate uh, in Europe and in the UK over the last sh relatively short period of time of the kind that, 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 that Colin was alluding to today. Much of the debate has been about the, the relative roles and responsibilities of equity ownership and the bondholders. And traditionally, we've not looked to bondholders to play a significant role uh, in the governance uh, of businesses in the UK. And that may, be, well, that may well be the right way forward, but obviously the, in, the, the changes in financial services, the introduction of um, bonds that can turn into equity start to call into question whether you have a different model. I think it is a, uh, I think the, 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 you have to recognize one of the things that debate showed up was that the rights of shareholders have an economic value. Uh, and if we're going to change the, uh, any of the, the relative uh, rights of shareholders, we're going to change that economic value. And we have to think, therefore, about what that economic impact is quite, quite seriously. I wouldn't say that the FRC, we know yet what, what, the, what, what that impact could be, but it's something we've really got to take into quite careful consideration. The one thing I think we do know is that in doing that, we've got to be very careful not to um, deter anyone from equity investment, because we do feel, I know perhaps I should say this, in, particularly in this institution, we do feel that equity uh, investment has a very powerful place to play in relation to the things that people have been talking about, innovation, growth, the development of the business. It is risk-bearing capital. It does have a vital place. It, the equity market is a way of getting out of the business, is a way of getting into the business, and we know people don't get into businesses apparently with the exception of Italian families, without having some idea about how they're going to get out of the business. So the model is one that I think works, and we have to be quite careful about uh, adjusting it. Um, I hear what uh, has been said about the European proposals, and uh, I have some sympathy that the, uh, the pro any um, change in that respect has got to be based upon uh, a really clear and uh, well-balanced definition of what's material, and perhaps we haven't quite got there yet. So I can understand, even though the Commission may feel that it's, it's operating quite close, and we may feel it's quite close to where we would be, uh, that question of materiality is an important one for us. Um, I, I mean, I, I welcome the, the fact that uh, the uh, Italian Committee is reviewing the quality of governance on a regular basis. I think that's a very good thing to do. Um, we have now done it, Chris is here, I think we've done it about three, three times now, haven't we? So, um, and we have found it uh, extremely valuable. If, if I've got one little anxiety about it, and this comes back to the question that was asked earlier on, um, and David's point about, uh, and David's response to that, is, is that we, we mustn't assume that everything we find every year when we review something requires an immediate response. Um, we've committed to not reviewing, not changing the corporate governance code once every two years. Some people have said to us it should be a longer period than that. We have certainly got to be very careful that just because there is a, an issue uh, and because the regulator can address it, that it doesn't mean to say that the regulator should address it. It may well be that the market will address it of its own volition given time. And that's something I think we have to, we have to pay attention to. We have 53 uh, provisions in our corporate governance code. So um, we've got quite a few, just to underline the point I've just been making. 93% um, of companies comply 
with either all of them or all but one or two, so we have a very high level of compliance. Um, but actually, we do value extremely the, the concept of complier explain. I think it's got to be based on some kind of regulatory framework. It, it's, it shouldn't be just self-regulation. Self um, but it has, I think, enabled us to develop a code that is very powerful because business has seen that each proposal, they will have an opportunity to undertake their own transition towards it. They will have an opportunity to, um, uh, to uh, perhaps implement it in a, in a way that suits them uh, particularly. And uh, I think that we've been able to do things like annual re-election of directors, which we think is very important for empowering shareholders should they want to use that power. Uh, the introduction of inde independent audit committees, the split of chairman and chief executive. All that came about in the UK much more efficiently, I think, on the back of the complier explain principle. So uh, I, th I think everyone's support for that is, is absolutely right. Um, We do, however, quite often get pressure to say in the greatest possible detail what each of those provisions really means. And there is elaboration in the code. But it is something that we uh, do want to push back on because one of the things that we are very determined to promote is the exercise of good judgment by the board. And we won't get that if in relation to every corporate governance provision or rule or whatever you want to call it, the FRC tells people exactly how to go about it. And it, it, it judgment is absolutely vital. Now, we, we have extended uh, the code into territory that is not classic corporate governance ter territory, and that's in relation to corporate reporting. Uh, now, we've done that um, because we actually think there is quite an important link between what the board is required to report on and what the board actually pays attention to. And therefore, they, they, those two things go together. So if we can get the, 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 the right sort of drivers for good reporting, it will have an impact on the quality of discussion in the boardroom and the things that the board pays attention to. We did, uh, so I just wanted to just give you a minute on that because I think there are a couple of things that, that one thing we've done and one thing we're, we're uh, very, very much on the edge of doing that is worth referring to. Uh, the first is that we introduced a requirement uh, two years ago uh, in September 2012 that the annual report of the directors should, as a whole, be fair, balanced and understandable. And I think that's a very important principle. Um, it requires the directors to make sure that there is nothing in the annual report that is just sort of marketing material and to think quite hard. It requires them to think hard about whether their story about the company, which is what the report should be given, is a balanced story. And I hope that that gives them an impetus to assess really whether the story that they're getting from the executive is a balanced story. So I think those words were very important. To the point about whether we should have more guidance or standards around some of the words, we resisted defining in any, great de in any detail at all the words fair, balanced, and understandable. That was despite the fact many people came to us and said, You've got, to, you've got to give us guidance on these things. And basically, our response to that was going by dictionary. And I think, I think we, um, if we had given guidance, we wouldn't have made what I think has been a beneficial impact in terms of, of uh, encouraging good judgment. The last uh, point I wanted to make in this reporting area was what um, Lord, Lord Sharman, Colin Sharman, uh, did for us in writing a report on uh, what he briefly called uh, on, on the concept of going concern. Now, we, we're all familiar with that. It's a one-year outlook. Um, and what Lord Charman said after the, in the wake of the financial crisis is, we've got to get boards taking a more forward-looking view and being willing to talk to their shareholders about that forward-looking view. Now, some boards feel really quite nervous about that. And writing uh, a provision on that has been really quite difficult because clearly the further you go out from this coming year, the harder it is to give any assurance. So we've had to think quite hard about what kind of assurance might be given and there hasn't been, there hasn't been clear common ground between in investors and directors on that. So what we're proposing at the moment is that 
uh, directors should first of all talk about their risks as required by the Companies Act and talk about how they're going to mitigate those risks, give their one-year outlook in, uh, in classic terms, but also talk about the, the viability over a longer period to the extent that they can have a reasonable expectation of the company's viability. And that phrase, reasonable expectation, is one that's going to require some judgment from, um, from, from directors. And that, um, but we're leaving it to directors to choose the period that they look for, because clearly there's a difference between what's relevant to shareholders who are investing in a company that builds nuclear power stations to, a, to investors who are investing in a company that builds plastic, uh, that makes plastic toys. So we think it's, and it's consistent with the ethos of the code, the comply or explain ethos, that directors choose that forward-looking period and then uh, state that whether or not they have a reasonable expectation of viability over that period. Now, in order for that to be meaningful, we, would, we hope that shareholders will get engaged in discussion around, around what the directors are reporting on. Um, and that's generally true of the code, and it's why David's point about stewardship is so important. If we have a comply or explain system and we get all the advantages of that, it is absolutely important that shareholders play their part, whether as asset owners or uh, uh, through their agents, the, the fund managers. Uh, the stewardship code, we've got fantastic numbers of people signing up to it, and, I, and we've got very high levels of engagement in the UK. Um, it is very focused, however, on remuneration. And I think the, the challenge for us going forward is, is to see that, that engagement broadening onto other issues. You may say that remuneration is a proxy for strategy, but actually in practice I suspect it isn't. Um, and uh, uh, so we need to broaden engagement. I mean, I think we need to encourage the owners themselves to think very hard about the mandates they're giving to their fund managers uh, to encourage that. That, that good quality engagement, because without that, our system has a fundamental flaw potentially in it, and that is therefore one of the priorities of the FRC looking forward to address that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so, uh, I just say from my side, I thought that was a, a, a fascinating, provocative. Um, Discussion um, and um, if I might exercise my uh, moderator's prerogative before I throw it to questions, just to, I mean to make an observation. I thought, from my perspective, I thought it was fascinating to um, hear the changes in Italian corporate governance and uh, um, and the shift towards a more UK model, with the implication being that a more dynamic, uh, a deeper capital market and a more dynamic market for corporate control will be. Uh, Better for growth and for innovation, and I'm just very conscious that that we're taking this discussion is taking place at a time where the UK seems to be losing a certain amount of confidence in that very um, uh, in, in in shareholder capitalism. Shareholder capitalism is a very, very big political debate clearly running in the UK at the moment over Pfizer's bid for AstraZeneca. There's also a big debate going in France over uh, GE's bid for the assets of Alstom. And uh, so I, I just, you know, just, uh, just before we say throw it up this question, I was just interested to get uh, some people on the panel's views on to what extent. I mean, it's clearly implicit in those political debates is a is a fear that, um, in some ways, that that sharehold that the that governance isn't working to in terms of stewardship, but it's not working in terms of uh, that, that. There's a public anxiety that. Um, that the corporate governance is not protecting uh, that that is not protecting growth or uh, investment, and I just wonder if, uh, uh, and I'm thinking particularly for the professors here, whether or not those anxieties are in any way justified, and what your observation would be on those particular situations. If I can start, uh, I entirely share your view that there is a lot of anxiety, and the way to respond to anxiety is to increase the rituals of corporate governance. So, so we are producing rules, regulations, and the Commission is doing a lot of work just to calm this type of anxiety with an answer that to me is partly at least wrong. So they are uh, using the wrong levers, like 
uh, trying to promote uh, shareholder engagement even where shareholders don't want to be engaged. Uh, so engagement very much depends on economic incentives. So there are situations where clearly there are incentives to be engaged. But if the incentives are not there, engagement becomes a pure uh, compliance issue. And this is really my worry. If we uh, adopt at European level a rule by which engagement becomes more or less compulsory, this will be dealt in firms by the compliance department. I mean, I, I mean in asset management firms. And after all, Stephen, what, what you said before, uh, you notice engagement here under the stewardship code, but the engagement is only on executive compensation matters. And, and this worries me in a way, because this means that investors have not really the incentives to be engaged. And if they don't want to be engaged, I don't see why we should make rules uh, compelling them to engagement. So my, my approach would be uh, the investors, uh, the asset managers, uh, the institutional investors, the hedge funds who want to be engaged, well, of course, they are welcome. And regulation uh, should create a climate where this is possible because engagement is positive. But we, I, I guess we should forget the idea of mandating engagement. And this is very much what the Commission is going to do. If I could perhaps <coughs> distinguish between two aspects of uh, this debate. One is whether or not takeovers, and in particular hostile takeovers, are necessarily a good thing. And secondly, the current debate, which is going on about the nationality of ownership. Uh, and I just want to say that the latter is an extremely misleading debate, uh, because for the to begin with, identifying the nationality of ownership of a diversified company, diversified ownership company like AstraZeneca or Pfizer is almost impossible. But then if you say, well, it's actually the beneficiaries that one really wants to determine the nationality of, it becomes even more absurd. Whereas in the case of companies where there is a dominant shareholder, as in the case of many Italian companies, the notion of the nationality of ownership does have some, some meaning to it. And, and, and what's really driving the, the, the nature of the uh, debate over here in relation to the uh, AstraZeneca bid uh, is, is, a, is again a, a significant diversion that it's basically a question of tax arbitrage on the part of the acquiring company. And that runs completely in the face of the notion that what the UK government is seeking to do is to avoid tax havens and to encourage essentially a, a level playing field in taxation. If the only way in which we can basically get assurances out of an acquiring company is through giving them tax incentives to be based over here, that's a very bad basis on which to give those types of assurances. What should be at the back of, the, of those debates are questions about how does one actually promote the industries that we're interested in? How does one promote pharmaceutical uh, investment? It's a matter of should one provide subsidies? Should one uh, promote the science base that lies behind them? The, the issue about ownership in this context is essentially missing the point as to what it is that's needed uh, really to to promote that activity. On the other hand, there is a real issue about whether or not having a free market for corporate control is inherently a desirable phenomenon. And the feature of the UK is not simply that it's the most open market to foreign acquisitions of any country in the world, but also that it's got one of the most liberal uh, approaches to to hostile takeovers. And for the reasons that we were saying earlier on, in most countries in the world, companies are essentially protected against acquisition. 
Now that's even true, again, if I come back to the United States, where in many cases companies are able to have a variety of forms of takeover defenses and where the f law, and in particular Delaware law, frequently ends up supporting management in the face of shareholder pressure for them to acquiesce to, uh, to hostile acquisitions. And that means that there is a much greater diversity of corporate form. And that's really, I think, what lies behind Guido's concerns about what the European Commission is trying to do. As you'll recall, a few years ago, it, it basically wanted to adopt the UK style of takeover provision across Europe. And you know, fortunately, it just ran into the ground because of uh, unrelenting political opposition to that. And I say fortunately, because basically it would have ended up having the effect that it's had in the UK. The problem has not been foreign acquisitions. We used to have a, po a policy of acquisitions to consolidate domestic companies. So we merged GEC into English Electric, we merged them both into Plessy until we had one dominant player in that industry. We did the same with chemicals. Uh, and the net consequence of that is when that one company falls over, as they did in both cases, then the whole industry collapses. And that is really the central issue as to whether or not we should be relying on that sort of external governance, external market for corporate control. It's not simply an issue about nationality of ownership. Do you want to comment before we go to questions? Any, anything other to say? Well, I think we do have to be careful in the UK about um, having a nationalistic view about acquisition when uh, UK outward investment is so strong and there's uh, you know, a bit of a difficulty in explaining to the rest of the world why we're happy to buy outside, but we'd, we might be unhappy to buy inside. And I, I also agree with, with Colin, you've got, to, you've got to look quite carefully about who, I mean, who owns the company before it's bought by the... I mean, we had this big debate a few years ago about Kraft and Cadbury. I think over 50% or 50 of the stock of Cadbury was already in the US hands before Kraft mounted a bid. So, you know, we're, we live in a global environment and we have to sort of, uh, to some extent, uh, accept that. So I, I think it's... Uh, I think the, 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 the sort of somewhat old-fashioned, I think, nationalistic approach to debating these things uh, does need to be uh, readdressed. Um, should I put it... Um, so, um, so, uh, so, we open to questions from the floor. Does anyone want to ask a question? Yes, right in the middle there. Yeah. Um, microphones. Do you want to say... Um, you are in your organization. Sure. My name is Joe Iwasaki from ICAW. Um, very stimulating and interesting discussion about uh, the corporate governance and recent development. I have um, a very simple question, which I feel slightly intimidated to ask after sometimes highly technical discussion. But um, on this point, Colin briefly mentioned um, in your parts of the discussion. But what do we think the purpose of corporate governance today? You said the purpose is no longer uh, minority shareholder protection or addressing agency issue. Um, I agree with that, but I just wondered whether people share a generally the same view as to the purpose of corporate governance. Because without that agreement, whether we are talking about shareholder voting or corporate governance code or similar um, regulation and re legislation, we may not be trying to resolve a challenge. And a uh, related question is, who should lead to address the challenge which corporate governance is trying to address? Um, this question is not particularly addressed to any pa um, panelists, so perhaps brief comments from each would be great. Um, I tell you what, why don't we just, um, why, just while the microphones go around, we just take a couple of questions so then we can, panel can answer them at 
Um, so I think it's probably quite a few. Um, you go, yes. Is it? Right, OK. Um, likewise, uh, Sarah Wilson from Manifest, my question is not addressed to anybody in particular. Minority shareholder protection is a key issue um, that we've heard debated today. And in the seven years that Manifest has been researching European companies in Italy in, in particular, we've seen some dramatic improvements in the quality of disclosures uh, from companies all around Europe. There, however, remain significant plumbing problems, which actually really prevent shareholders from engaging and participating. Um, access to the AGM isn't as easy as you imagine. Uh, the ballots, the, the slate agendas coming out 18 days before a shareholder meeting leave six days for shareholders to review and make a considered decision because the intermediaries, the custodian banks, are setting cutoffs of 12 days before the meeting. Now, that just makes the whole process little more than kabuki theatre, quite frankly. And we have um, so much focus on the high-level principles of governance but I'm afraid the practicalities are letting the process down. Um, and I think this is where SRD2, the update, is so immensely disappointing in that it's tried to shoehorn some very important issues in as a kind of a, a codicil when really it really needs its own directive. So I just wanted to understand the, op the opinions of the committee on how we can get the plumbing working so that the engagement and dialogue can take place. Thanks very much. I'll take, take one more now, uh, yes, um, uh, well, I first of all let me thank uh, Sergio Albarelli. I'm Domenico Siniscalco uh, of Morgan Stanley, formerly chairman of uh, Associazione for the kind words you had uh, for my job. It was a privilege to work with the funds in Italy, and I learned a lot. I also would like to congratulate uh, Gabriele Galateri and the other members of, of the Governance Committee for the excellent uh, job they did. Uh, it seems to me, however, that uh, due to changes in reality, they face uh, now a major set of conceptual issues related to the fundamental change in the ownership structure of the Italian companies. Because we are coming from uh, period where the Italian companies were owned either by the state or by the families or the foundations. And now we are quickly moving into already into a situation where the majority of the shareholders in the shareholder meetings are actually the institutional investors. In that context, some of the institutions that were created explicitly to protect uh, minority shareholders, assuming they were actually the minority, might work even in an unintended counterproductive way. For example, the most interesting, one of the most interesting protection for minorities were the, the possibility to appoint the chairman of the auditors in the company, Consiglio uh, dei Sindaci. Now, if the majority, the majority shareholders becomes number two, not only they are controlling shareholders, but they can even appoint the head of the, of the audit committee, just a minor example. So the question is, how does the committee uh, believes uh, to deal with the, new, with the new reality, which will increasingly emerge for the basic reason of a combination between uh, regulation, Basel III, for example, and the basic fact that Italian traditional shareholders are running out of money, which is more important than anything else. So in a sense, we have to move from a governance system which was created in order to create a check and balance into a new governance system where basically there, you need more cooperation. And that's, in my opinion, is non-trivial. And uh, of course, I don't want an answer immediately. But it's certainly the, something that we should put on the agenda. Because otherwise, we could have uh, typically the defense for the last war is not necessarily the best defense for the next war. It's not, and we're not talking about wars here, okay, of course, <laughs> but, uh, but certainly um, in some wars there were some battles. <laughs> Thank you. Right, should we um, take those uh, three questions? So um, who'd like to go first? Um, Professor. Well, maybe, maybe I could uh, try to answer uh, the first question, the goals of cover governance. It's, uh, it's really an issue that we 
uh, considered in our introductory chapter in the volume with Massimo Beccredi. So we ask what are the goals of corporate governance and we give different answers because of course you cannot, if you look at it broadly and you follow a European international perspective, of course you cannot answer the goal is only to maximize uh, shareholder value or to maximize enterprise value. Uh, there are countries and approaches which also give a lot of value to stakeholder protection and also to the public interest perspective. Particularly in the case of banks, I, I think today it is quite clear that the goals pursued by corporate governance are also in the, let's say, in the uh, risk management uh, and uh, depositor protection sphere. That is to say, no doubt regulators today rely on boards a lot also for uh, protecting depositors and the financial system. So that in my view, and this is reflected in our volume and in our introductory chapter, uh, the perspective today should be broader and include a number of goals which traditionally were quite uh, set aside. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. Um, well, it's a very good question. We, we debated long and hard at the FRC board uh, three or four years ago what, what was our goal, what was our mission as an organization. and, and our mission is to promote high quality corporate governance and corporate reporting to foster investment. So, and we, we, we put it that way rather than to say to protect investors, but because we wanted the, to stress the, that there had to be an economic benefit from this to the UK. And, that, and that's, that's why we, we alighted on those words. So investor protection is, is fundamentally important because we won't be fostering investment until, unless we get some of that. But we've got to, we, we've got to think about the goal, and I, I, I think uh, to the last, the, sec the third question, you know, the, the global flows of capital are huge and increasing. And if any country feels it's running a bit short of capital, it's out there. The question is, how do we draw it in? And that's got to be based upon, I would suggest, uh, good quality corporate governance, assuring investors that they will get fairly dealt with, uh, that they know what they're getting into, and that they therefore they are willing to put money in that direction. Now, I mean, I've had discussions with, um, I think London has been successful in that. Um, we've had discussions with major sovereign wealth funds, sometimes to encourage them to exercise more stewardship um, input in the UK. And actually, it's been a rather good thing that they've said, well, actually, we don't do that much, um, particularly overtly, but we don't do that much because actually we trust corporate governance in the UK and we're willing to put our money there and we put our effort in terms of engagement elsewhere. And I was kind of quite encouraged by that because it, it suggests that the money is, is flowing in on the back of that confidence. What we've got to be careful of is that we don't so write the pitch to the rest of the world that, you know, we're just drawing any dollar we can get in uh, and we're undermining the quality of our regulatory regime and our corporate governance regime and so on in order to get it because I think there is money out there, there is investment out there that wants to come on the back of a good quality regime and that's really our goal. So do you want to respond to any of those I, questions? I'd say if I can summarize the, basically the three questions. Governance is about principles and the implementation of the principle is down to the individual, the individual corporation or the individual asset manager, either with the stewardship codes or the internal rules of control. Participation to annual general meetings, uh, it, is it is still complicated. Obviously, uh, as a stakeholder in the market, everybody should make sure that there will be more simplification in order to make sure there will be individual access to this type of participation. But nonetheless, let's be realistic, uh, uh, Europe is pretty complex, even the differences between UK and Italy are significant. Uh, so coming out with a rule of thumb, it will be the same one 
Europe-wide, it will be extremely complicated and probably not really the best solution. And as much as the last question coming from Domenico, uh, it is true, the country is going through a significant change into the structures of control. Uh, family, state, foundations are now gradually losing some part of the control. There will be more variable alliances in controlling listed companies. Nationality should not be a problem because the important is how a company is run and not really who controls it, if it's UK or Italian or German or whatever. But nonetheless, there are significant factors which are driving into a more complex type of governance going forward. And no need to say, and I totally agree with what you said, governance is a key element in order to convince international capital markets to invest into specific markets. And governance, again, has to be qualified very simply as the respect of the sort of international rules of good behavior. They are not going to be similar 100%, but they have to be based on principles. If you are allowed to do this as a company or a, as a stakeholder, you might expect a higher qualification of your job and your opportunities to raise this capital. It's not going to be that simple. It will be very complex. Companies need to make sure that they will be delivering those messages very clearly. The environment, the legal environment, the market environment has to be improved. And again, cooperation between stakeholders. And at the end, lots of the, let me say, responsibility is down to asset managers because they are the one really pouring the money into either a market or a company. And an asset manager usually, not in all cases, but usually is taking decision on facts again. And facts, as what we see now in Italy, are driving through conclusion which are the governance is getting better. And that's the reason why we do see as an association more assets, more flows of investment coming from outside into the country. Thank you. Um, Colin, do you want to? Yes, yeah. if, if I could just try to answer the three questions together, the three questions about who should be, Joe's question about who should be defining uh, corporate governance, the rights of shareholders at AGMs, and Domenico's um, question about the changing structure of Italian ownership. In, in terms of who, who, who should be defining corporate governance, my response to that would be simply the company. And by the company, what I mean is a combination of the owners and the uh, management stroke board. Uh, and the, the reason for, for arguing that is that there's increasing evidence as to what governance stroke ownership gives rise to successful economic performance. In particular, the, there's one very interesting study done by a number of Harvard professors recently that demonstrates that it's a combination of having an owner that's really interested in the long-term performance of the corporation, having uh, a clearly defined set of values and principles by that owner, having a board that is really well bought in to those values and principles and where there's a coherent set of uh, similar interests between the board uh, and the owners, and where those principles and values are drilled right down throughout the corporation. That, that those seem to be the, the key components that are associated uh, with successful uh, corporate performance. And in that regard, in, in, in terms of the question about the changing structure in Italy, I'd suggest that the, the greatest risk is not that essentially one uh, has inadequate uh, representation or participation by minority shareholders, but that you end up with the UK problem that you don't have any owners. As Paul Miners is putting it, we've become an ownerless economy. And the problem that an ownerless economy has is it's impossible for the management to know what the owners want. Uh, and that, that, I think, is a real issue that... Um, uh, arises in the context of essentially a system that has evolved into one of such uh, hi high levels of dispersion of ownership. 
And it comes to the question about the role in, uh, of shareholders and AGMs. Because actually, frankly, uh, AGMs are almost in, uh, an irrelevance from, from the point of view of serious corporate governance. There have been a number of studies that have been undertaken in the US of the effects of shareholder resolutions uh, on uh, corporate performance of uh, US companies, which finds basically there's no impact, no significant impact. On the other hand, there have been an, a lot of studies that have been done recently looking at shareholder activism, which is essentially not at the AGMs, but is private uh, discussions between <coughs> increasingly hedge funds uh, and uh, boards about uh, the policies of, of companies. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that at least in terms of shareholder performance, that's where the shareholder gains come from. Now, uh, the, 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 the issue uh, that, 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 that arises, and, and Stephen has, has referred to it, is in terms of is one system better at generating more external participation, equity finance in particular, than another. And here again, the evidence is quite contrary to the common perceptions. The UK, and John Kay makes this point in his, in his report, has for the last 30 or so years had negative net equity raised by the UK corporate sector. The amount that it pays out in the form of dividends, share repurchases, and in corporate acquisitions exceeds the amount that it raises on a regular basis. Whereas in many other countries in the world, including those where there are dominant shareholders, the amount of equity finance has been significantly greater and positive. And that suggests that the role of a dominant shareholder can be extremely important, not just in terms of governance, but in terms of the criteria of meeting the financing of corporations with equity. Is, is there, I mean, to some extent, isn't the antidote to, the, to that, the takeover? Because the takeover comes in and it does give it some direction. It, it may not be that value creating. Or the other antidote may be private equity, because that comes in and gives it direction and ownership and for a period, and then it moves it back into the market. So I just wonder if you look at all the different sort of mechanisms in, in our market, whether actually they do kind of add up to something that sort of works. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, Stephen. And, that, and that's a very interesting observation, that in essence, and uh, one, one Harvard economist, Michael Jensen, described it as the eclipse of the public corporation, that basically what's happened because of the failure of the government system associated with dispersed ownership, that what's emerging are alternative forms of ownership like private equity that essentially become the mechanism of governance. And in essence, what we're observing in this country is a shift away from public ownership. Leave aside this, what, what I was just saying about new equity issues. A striking feature of the UK is how the number of companies listed on the main market has collapsed uh, over the last uh, decades. And the same is happening increasingly in the US. And, and basically, we're being driven to a system in which we're returning to almost the family ownership system. Family ownership by the back door through private equity firms because the system of dispersed ownership is not delivering in terms of governance or the financing of corporations. Uh, very interesting. Right. Uh, so you take a, a, a bunch more questions. Uh, quick answers and quick responses. We've got to get more in. So I think there's quite a few. So you go... Um, Sorry, uh, the second row. Uh, oh, Peter, thank you. Continue. Peter Montagnon from the Institute of Business Ethics. Um, I just want to push a little back on Guido Ferrarini, if I may. And I say gently, because I think this is about balance. And I'm not at all sure myself that the Commission has the balance right. 
But I'm a bit worried about the tone of this conversation because it seems to suggest that there's something wrong about giving rights to shareholders. I mean, you know, what's wrong with giving some power to shareholders? And, I mean, let's go back in time a little bit in this country and remind ourselves that when the family-owned brewers, wonderful things, family-owned companies, um, wanted more money in the 1990s, they came to the institutions and the institution said, we'll give you more money, but we want rights. We don't want your special voting rights. We don't want all this privileges for you as controlling shareholders. And you can't have the money if you don't give us those rights. So here, I think there is something quite important, isn't there, about efficient markets and the rights of people who put capital into those markets. And there must be some rights or they won't put capital in. And I think one of the pressures that is going on to the markets now as the ownership fragments and internationalizes um, is you've got international owners who won't come into places if they don't have rights. So my question to you is really, you know, if you think shareholders are, as you seem to think, um, not very helpful people who should go away, um, uh, actually, but you do want their money, you know, what sort of rights do we have to give them in order to have an efficient capital market? Perhaps you could help on that. Thank you. Should we just go, go, should we just take a couple more? Because otherwise, we, there's some people who want to ask questions. Yes. Um, so back here, and then, and then, uh, and this side here. And also here, I've got the microphone. Oh, sorry. So I don't know. Well, we've got two microphones here. We've got two okay. microphones, and then it's a lady in purple in the, yeah. in the middle there. We can take her as well. I want to take... We'll take two, four. Tim Ward from the Quoted Companies Alliance. Um, I, I'm concerned about the characterization of the UK market as being one of dispersed share ownership. Uh, something like 80% of the listed companies have a market capitalization below 200, 250 million. And many, many of the companies at the lower end of the scale uh, do have quite concentrated shareholdings. And the engagement between shareholders in the smaller and the mid-sized quoted companies uh, it, it, it is a lot uh, more intense than, uh, the, the, than in the largest companies. If you invest to 5 or 10 million euro in HSBC and ring up to speak to the chairman, or if you invest the same in Barclays and ring up to speak to the chairman, you probably don't get past the switchboard. If you invest 10 million euro in a small cap, I think you, they'll probably send a car around to pick you up to have a chat. <laughs> um, and I think that the, the difference when it comes to corporate governance is that uh, there's, there has to be a trust because you know who your shareholders are. You, you have a direct relationship uh, with those shareholders. And, and I'm very interested in the concept of corporate governance. We publish, as the Quoted Companies Alliance, a corporate governance code for, uh, for the smaller companies on the AIM market. Um, but I do think there's a difference between financial companies, non-financial companies, between large companies and small companies. And the more you move away from principles to 59 or 58 sets of... Only 53. 53, sorry. <laughs> there'll be, I'm sure there'll be more to come because ours does get longer, I have to admit as well. Um, but the more you get down to sort of more detail, you move further away from principles and therefore it becomes more difficult to have a proportionate approach for those different sets from the financial, the non-financial, the large and the small. So I would just be interested to see whether it's time to actually say, let, let's actually cut the cake and cut the market in a different way um, rather than just say everything, you know, one size fits all. Right, thanks. So, if, um, yes, gentlemen there, and then, yeah. and then if you pass the microphone. Yeah, I will do, don't worry. Thank you. Peter Norman, I'm a member of the European Tr Post Trade Group, which is uh, a body concerned with plumbing, as it happens, and one of the plumbing issues that it is concerned about is the um, issue of cross-border representation at annual meetings. And I, I was a bit disappointed to hear the way this was treated. Um, uh, Mr. Alberelli simply talking about complexities in Europe and Mr. Meyer um, taking a view that um, shareholder democracy doesn't seem to count, which seems very odd the day after you pick up the newspaper, the Financial Times today, and read about shareholders at AGMs holding two large companies to account on issues of remuneration. But that said, um, there is a big problem on cross-border 
um, representation at AGMs, and it's, um, these are impediments, and they're called vested interests. And the vested interests are the intermediaries who are, as um, the questioner said earlier, creating great problems. And that questioner's question wasn't answered in one jot. So I just wonder who should take up this cause. Um, clearly, none of the panel are interested in it. Is it an issue for the commission? Is it an issue for the industry? I'd have thought personally that um, an organization like Frank in Templeman Investment should have been fully engaged in this, but obviously I come from the wrong planet. So I'll pass the microphone along to the lady who wants to ask another question. Thank you. Okay, so Guido's just popped other in for, for, for a couple of minutes, but he'll be back in a second. But carry on with your Can question. I? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I hope it's not the case of uh, it's not over until the fat lady sings. But <laughs> here we go. My, I am Paola Perotti, and I am a, an investor. And um, one of uh, the and I've invested in Europe over a long, long period. When I invest in the UK, I feel protected for two main reasons. One of them was alluded to by Mr. Mayer, which is the class one uh, protection. But also there is an important right, which I'm surprised none of you have mentioned, preemption rights. So in the UK, I know that if people want to go ahead and make a huge acquisition, they cannot issue more than 5% of shares without asking me if I want some of the shares. And whereas in the rest of Europe, uh, preemption rights are very different. In France, um, companies can issue shares up to 15% of the capital on a non-preemptive basis. In Holland, they can issue up to 20% on a preemptive basis. And I, I just wonder why we don't look at a pan-European solution for preemption rights. I mean, as a matter of principle, I will not, uh, uh, I will vote against uh, any preemption, any dis dis uh, any this application of preemption rights, which is above 10% of the capital. Mm. Okay, well, uh, Stephen, do you want to start with that one? Uh, well, well, yes, I mean, the, the, the FRC, questions. we very much uh, support preemption rights. Um, sometimes in the UK, they, uh, their existence has been debated. The biotech sector felt that they were an inhibition to growth at one point, um, and we very much oppose that. So I, I would certainly certainly wouldn't want to see them threatened in the UK and, and would be very happy to promote them elsewhere in the European Union. Um, we, we have actually raised with a, a companies on a, a small number of occasions whether they were holding their AGM in such a way as to enable access, um, particularly where they were holding it. Uh, very anxious about companies holding um, uh, AGMs in in countries where the bulk of their shareholders are not, for example. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be beyond the wit of man for technology to produce an answer here. Um, and I, I do think that that is, that is an important, uh, important matter. I mean, I, whenever I suggest technology is the answer to it, I get rung up by a very large number of retired accountants and generals who want everything done on paper. Um, but uh, I, I do think this is an area where we've got to get more access for, for more shareholders in an easier and more modern way. Uh, thank you, Stephen. So just to, to let Guido know, there was a question while you were out of the room on preemption rights and whether there should be a European regime on preemption rights. But I know you particularly wanted to uh, respond to Peter Montagna. Yes, and so you yes uh, nice. yeah, I'd like to thank Peter. <coughs> Peter, of course, uh, your comments are absolutely right, and I share them, even though they were addressed to me in a kind of, as a kind of criticism, but you are right. I mean, I try to be provocative in the sense of showing that uh, the European Commission is probably rebalancing the powers of boards and shareholders in an excessive way. And, and this excessive way is, after all, the UK approach that you, Stephen, said uh, it's difficult to get accepted in Brussels, but I think that this time you have oh, won. You have won in completely. This is well, not won in the sense that it will be <coughs> all regulation. So there isn't much room for uh, private courts. I guess it will be mainly 
regulation from Brussels. But Peter was right in saying, of course, we should grant rights to shareholders. And as I tried to say also, we should welcome shareholder activism. I'm not against it. But as Colin said before, uh, we'd like to see a true engagement of, say, hedge funds. And, and that could be beneficial. So you need to have all the rights in place. Uh, except that uh, we should not promote uh, engagement by law if uh, shareholders don't want to be engaged. And I see many of them who don't want to be engaged. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Right, I should just warn, I think we're, we're, we're pretty much run out of time. So if Colin and uh, Sergio want to, you know, in your comments, just reflect on any last comments um, as well as the questions, then uh, Sergio, you want to go first? Oh, yeah. I regret you didn't like my comment about complexity, but obviously I was not intending to be here today to give a lecture about how the different complexity of annual shareholders meetings and so on and so on is supposed to be managed Europe-wide. As an asset manager, we are participating to thousands of those meetings in hundreds of countries. We know the complexity of it. As an asset manager, I'm not supposed to call the local <laughs> regulator and say that all the rules Europe-wide or worldwide should be exactly the same. I accept those rules. I try to maximize my efforts in participating to those meetings. And I'd like to say that regardless of the fact that we're talking about meetings, and I totally agree with you, it's very important that activism is not limited to general meetings. Activism is before and after. Is direct contact with the listed company, is direct contact with the management of the company. In a sense, uh, that specific moment, i.e. the participation of that specific moment of the corporate life is important, but it's complex, again, and it's different. Participating to whatever happens in, uh, in an Italian listed company or in a British one or a French one is totally different. And your comment about preemption, <clears throat> I cannot agree more. What can I say? Okay, so first of all, Peter's uh, question about uh, uh, shareholder rights. The, uh, the, some of the, the most successful system at the moment is regarded as being the uh, Nordic uh, countries. Uh, for example, Sweden's system uh, of governance is one that many people uphold as being, uh, having, having many beneficial features associated with it. And what's interesting about that system is it's one that has <coughs> dominant shareholders. So, for example, the Wallenbergs uh, in controlling uh, um, Ericsson and Electrolux have uh, essentially dual-class shares that allow them to control. But there is also very strong minority investor protection. And indeed, the owners of uh, those corporations and similarly in Denmark uh, whether they're dominant shareholders, they take, they give a lot of importance to their share price and protecting minority shareholders. Why? It's a bit along the lines of the breweries that you were just talking about. They, they wanted to raise capital, they, and they repeatedly want to raise capital. And if they don't protect minority shareholder interests, then their ability to do so uh, is, is limited. The issue about preemption rights uh, that Paula uh, raised is one that um, is an important element of minority protection uh, in, in, in this country. I happen to have been on Paul Miner's committee that discussed uh, the merits when the uh, biotech companies objected to them. Uh, and, and the interesting issue that arose was not whether or not preemption rights were desirable, because in many cases, actually, they clearly were an important part of shareholder uh, interest. But whether or not, essentially, one should have a rule that applies across the board. And that, this really comes on to the third question about the distinction between small and large companies and the plea not to have one size fits all. Because that's exactly what is required. There really were finely balanced arguments in some cases between whether or not it was better to, for some companies to be able to forego preemption rights and raise cheaper external equity 
as against ensuring that the rights of existing share shareholders uh, were upheld. And if shareholders can agree on whether or not they are desirable or undesirable, then the notion of there being a variety and choice that companies should be able to have seems to be one that has a lot of attraction associated with it. The final issue about uh, democracy, shareholder democracy, uh, and voting at shareholders' meetings. My observation was not that uh, we shouldn't have uh, governance through uh, shareholder meetings, but that that was not currently the way in which uh, shareholder activism was exercised. I think that uh, ways of trying to make shareholder meetings operate more effectively alongside the type of more private negotiations that go on between dominant shareholders and management is an important development. And I think that there are very significant potential that's really emerging as a consequence of technological developments, which basically in a few years' time will mean that people cross-border, within <coughs> borders, will be able to watch meetings, participate in meetings, vote at meetings electronically. And that, I think, is potentially the one of the more interesting developments that will take place in this area. Great. Thank you very much, Colin. I'm afraid I think that's pretty much all the time we've got for questions. So I'd like to thank the panel very much for a fascinating debate. Um, I guess we're going Um, thank you. And I think uh, Stefano Mikosi is going to um, now give some concluding remarks. Thank you. So we come to the end uh, of this very rich, interesting meeting. And uh, I, I, first of all, must uh, really warmly thank um, the London Stock Exchange, uh, Sir David Walker, Gabriele Galatei, for being here with us today, and the panel members for a very uh, rich uh, discussion. Um, we continue to invest uh, in what is, we hope, a useful research on these capital market issues. And I think uh, uh, this work on corporate governance has revealed uh, useful and relevant. Um, without um, trying to do justice to all the very interesting comments that I've heard, I will make uh, only um, a few uh, short statements on what I have retained of uh, this debate. So the, the first thing is, of course, that good governance is useful. It's a useful tool to improve the quality of our stock markets, transparency, protection of minority shareholders against extraction of private benefits of control. And fair enough, this improvement is there. We, we have the evidence. It is behavior is adapting. Um, and Italy is a good uh, student in this uh, game. Um, I think um, ahead of what is happening in other capital markets in continental Europe. Uh, the second point, however, is that a very important aspect of the game is that one size does not fit all. <laughs> And as has been stressed by many, there is a paramount need for flexibility, which remains important for the ability of the system to adapt to different company characteristics and to the different features of our economic systems. There is here a narrow path to be found to provide guidance without unduly restrictive. And I think the comments made were very useful in this uh, regard. On the one hand, people asking for guidance. On the other hand, once you try to sit down and write it, you find that the task is very complex. And it is clear that on the back, as was said, of the comply or explain principle, we've traveled quite um, some distance. And we have achieved significant results, um, for instance, in um, separating uh, the chairmen and CEOs uh, in improving the quality of directors and the functioning of the boards. Um, and this is good. It is also true that improved governance has not impeded egregious failures. Uh, we've had, um, uh, well, fantastic failures of governance 
in a um, very visible uh, episode uh, in, in both our countries uh, where the system simply didn't have, seemed to have enough um, antibodies against egregious degeneration in behavior. Um, of course, there are things that governors can do to uh, try to tackle this problem, and I think there was an emphasis placed on the need to privilege the substance of a form. Uh, this has been an issue. Again, we have improvement, but the problem has not gone away. Um, but there is also a need for stronger market discipline here. Now, the engagement of investors is a critical aspect of this uh, strengthened market discipline, and uh, we see progress. We see progress. The stewardship code, again, coming from the UK market, is a major development in this regard. Um, I very much agree and stress the fact that it is also very complex. It's creating new questions. You have private engagement. Is private engagement creating uh, uh, distortions or benefits? And is private engagement always conducive to uh, better market functioning or improper uh, deals? And um, we have tried, uh, uh, we've discussed a lot within the Corporate Governance Committee in Italy, this issue of improving market discipline. It has been a discussion about what is the proper way of strengthening monitoring mechanisms and whether or not we should create uh, uh, mechanisms for objective monitoring. We found that all the players in the game had little incentive to participate, however. Um, so we are still there. Um, the best thing we can think of remains uh, investors as the main players. Um, the idea of finding somebody in the private sector willing to raise the yellow card, we haven't made much progress. We do produce a report which is based on the monitoring exercise by Asonime, which identifies uh, what appear to be um, constant weaknesses, and we denounce them without making names, but it would be impossible for us to make names because these are our members. So what we have found is that we denounce the problem without saying who is failing. So monitoring perhaps is helping, but the role of investors remains key. Okay, complex, as you said, but key. And investors are um, starting to behave in a way. For those who um, have been in the, in the boards of Italian companies, we know the tradition of investors coming to the assembly and always voting against. And this is just a, a problem of their responsibilities that they don't want to take vis-a-vis -vis their investors. Uh, this is changing now. They are taking an active and positive view, and they are starting to express views and all that. Again, a process. And then we come to the question of um, what the Commission is trying to do. Well, here, um, uh, we, I, I tend to share uh, the view of those who express concern. Because one thing is to say that it, we want better governance. One thing is to say that whenever we identify an issue through our self-discipline mechanism, then the Commission comes up and they say, well, this is the right issue where to put a new European law. Uh, this will, is disruptive for the process of building good governance. Uh, and uh, it, will be, it would be overly rigid. And the risk that it is wrong is enormous. Uh, is it better to order the company to establish by law that shareholders should, should vote? Or is it better to establish a market standard whereby um, investors will reward companies where shareholders vote on certain issues? And I think this, uh, uh, we have to be aware that if corporate governance is perceived as the uh, Trojan horse for further regulation, people will shy away from corporate governance exercises. And I think the Commission is overdoing it. 
when they want to force a vote on pay, while I consider it entirely appropriate that the shareholders take a view on uh, remuneration policies mm -hmm. and uh, their impact on the company performance. And there are many ways to achieve that. And then we come to the final question, which is the question raised by Colin uh, Meyer um, about governance and real economic performance. And here, um, uh, this is quite a difficult, um, a difficult issue. Uh, this was a debate that for some time was on uh, at the beginning of the last decade. There was that beautiful research produced by Marco Becht and others at the Institute for Corporate Government. And then um, many people, for instance in Italy, thought uh, that governance was a, a good place where to start to change the economic structure of Italy. In other words, by forcing changes in governance, by introducing governance arrangements similar to those in more developed markets, then we change economic performance. I think this is, um, we should be very cautious in taking this approach. Here there is clearly an issue of, you know, what causes what, or of um, uh, simultaneity, if you wish. Because indeed, you observe better governance in economic systems that are open and that uh, are more competitive and where capital can flow in and flow out freely. But this is not the typical economic structure that we have uh, uh, in the continent. And I have doubts that you can force the change through governance arrangements. Uh, very clearly, uh, still today, the main question in continental Europe is that our capital markets for FDI are not open. And they are not open. This is strictly complementary to the fact that our labor markets are not open. Now, can you resolve the problem by forcing the UK governance arrangements? Um, can you convince um, France to accept the free movement of capital to buy Alstom uh, by um, changing governance arrangements. Here, I think uh, uh, we would be going too far. Uh, and this, of course, is, has implications for how much you want to do through the law and how much you want to do through self-governance uh, arrangements. Um, so I would end you know, with this simple proposition. I, I think we should be careful in transforming rights for investors into obligations for investors. And I think we should be keenly aware of the fact that governance is not and then in itself, but it's a means um, to certain limited ends. I think Sir David Walker said, we should not expect too much from this particular tool. Uh, and if we overdo it, we may, we may break it or weaken it or break it. Thank you all for uh, being here today. And I wish you a very nice, we have a cocktail out here, a very nice uh, rest of the afternoon and evening. Thank you.